And here we are on the other side of watching three Schumacher horror films. And we start things off right away with The Lost Boys, which right out of the gate, of course, is the one that both of us have seen the most. It's the one that's surrounded by the most iconography. I'm kind of amazed that in spite of the fact that obviously I love the film, it's still almost surprising to see how many ways Lost Boys keeps popping up in popular culture. Like it keeps kind of popping up here and there referentially. And part of that's because, you know, people that grew up with it, like we did uh, in some measure, they are also of age and making art themselves. Right. So that's uh, at least a part of it. Um, I don't know that it will always happen, but it's still fascinating how much The Lost Boys has been this kind of touchstone film for many people. And on one hand, it's just a super cool and super fun movie. It's very funny. It's a comedy at plenty of turns, just as much as it's also uh, very horror at other turns. One of my favorite things about The Lost Boys, and I, this also speaks to what I brought up before in our introduction about this kind of cross-generational aspect to the story, is like uh, something that happens to all the characters, a lot of the characters at some point, something that happens really early on whenever they're going to grandpa's house. They're walking up and grandpa's playing dead. Yes. And to him, it's this hilarious gag, this great little thing. And when he's like, ha ha, I gotcha. Like he's entirely in his own world. He might be enjoying the reefer, but regardless of which, like he's entirely in his own headspace and he's proud of this moment. He's had his laugh and absolutely nobody else was fooled for a moment. His daughter, the, the matriarch of the family, she walks up and checks on, you know, just to be responsible, but she's not really concerned you can see it in her like she's like right basically a step away from just sighing immediately You're like there he is <laughs> Ed. wish he wouldn't and the kids just aren't having it at all they're just like right passively accepting it but it's not just that moment obviously that i'm talking about i'm talking about the way that the movie is playful but it also establishes that its characters are not perfect they're struggling at times the frog brothers aren't nearly as aware of things as they think they are a lot of the characters are so much in their own headspace but they aren't really as in control of things as they think they are so that adds to the humor of the movie but it also adds some to the tension as well because these characters are so out of their league you know i think that's one of the things that makes the movie what it is and part of what makes it so special i absolutely love and adore the sequence when they go in the cave and they're ready to take down these vampires right and they're not in the least bit prepared for what they're going to see no <laughs> at any point i'm like well of course yeah that's uh this is their coffin they're uh of course they're hanging upside down in the ceiling you know like up there in a cave that's what they are and meanwhile they're thinking bum 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 you know like they're there's no way they're not terrified at the same time but they're so cocky and self-assured and they have to put up that front to be like yeah well we got the stakes and we're uh just gonna climb up there now and uh, we'll get them. We'll, we'll get them. This is, they're vulnerable. Right. And the second they get one, and they do actually kill a vampire. But obviously, it's immediately a huge, dangerous mess at the same time. I, I just find that, that aspect of the movie really appealing. Uh, 
and and it, again it also to me speaks to the the cross generational generational nature of the story which is not something that was present in the original script either that's something that Joe Schumacher himself helped bring to the story because he thought that the character should be aged up. I mean, when you hear the title, the first thing you probably, a lot of people would probably think of is Peter Pan and the Lost Boys, and you would think younger. And this was originally supposed to be a Richard Donner movie uh, with the script by Jan Fisher, James Jeremias. Their script had Goonies aged children younger characters and i don't know what that movie looks like right <laughs> i can't really imagine that vampire movie with all goonies aged kids i i really would love to almost see that world that alternate reality where richard donner made this vampire movie of the lost boys but i'm also incredibly grateful that we got joe schumacher involved instead and got jeffrey Boehm to write this rewrite on, on the script and make it into what it is with some younger kids and also the older ones and that makes the movie a lot of what it is you know jeffrey bohm of course he he one of the things that he wrote was uh, the dead zone which i really enjoy that film inner space is a terrific movie that uh, doesn't always get its due. It's fantastic. He wrote on Lethal Weapon. He wrote Lethal Weapon 2. Yes. Yeah. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And this guy is, I think, undoubtedly, along with Joe Schumacher and his influence, what makes The Lost Boys what it is. I mean, and, and like I said, a huge part of that is Joe Schumacher himself and his vision and his idea and a big part of it, what he wanted to do he's like, he wants to like make it sexier. He thought it should be, should be a sexier movie with older characters. But I also enjoy the way that it isn't sexy at times too. And the characters very much again, like out of their league, like Jason Patrick is a terrific essentially main character like I, I think it's easy to say that he's the main hero of the story right even though uh, there were plenty of other turns that were with Corey Haim Jason Patrick is a good hero one of my favorite little things in this movie is when uh, he's he suddenly starts flying and he can't control it and he grabs onto the phone cord to possibly hold him in <laughs> which also helps him talk his mom down. Right. You know, whenever his uh, mom is possibly freaking out and he just so happens, oh, hey, I have the phone here so I can uh, say, no, I'm fine. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Everything's fine here, mom. While I'm flying outside the window. Then he convinces his brother to let him in, even though his brother's freaking out, obviously, too, for good reason. And then when he does let him in, it's this great moment. But at the same time, he kind of seems to stop flying. And in a way, in a way, it might seem like I'm nitpicking the moment a little bit, but I'm not exactly uh, really nitpicking. I'm not even saying it's a terrible thing. Not really. Like I actually think that that that's a terrific moment and speaks to the beauty and the way that the story is told. Like, it's fast-paced. It's funny. It doesn't take itself too seriously. But it also takes itself just seriously enough that it has an edge to it. Because that sequence when Michael is seduced into becoming a vampire is one of the best stretches of the whole film. Yeah. And it's played deadly seriously. And it's fantastic. And it's terrifying. There's so much that happens there, like hanging on to the bottom of these train tracks you know yeah that's a terrifying moment that edginess is uh, th something that's definitely present in the story while at the same time so much of it is also hilarious i i also am reminded at times of, of oddly enough et because of the family nature of the story you know right 
in the household that's a product of divorce, but we don't really talk about dad that much. It's just this kind of hanging thread. Right. And by no means is the divorce as ingrained in the Lost Boys as much as it is in E.T. E.T. is basically about that, and you notice that more when you are an adult. <laughs> right. Uh, the kind of deeper nature of the story. The Lost Boys is uh, more fanciful about it, but I don't think it's a mistake that that is in there too, where it, there's something about it, about that part of the story and Diane Weist, who's utterly fantastic. Yeah. And seeing her, especially right at the end, when she suddenly is part of the vampire story and not just on her own right. part of the story, unawares of the real dangers, the supernatural danger that surrounds her. When she realizes that uh, she's actually been Edward Herman, you know, basically trying to lure her into this fold to be the mother of the lost boys. It's this kind of wonderful moment of betrayal i feel like but also a moment of her kind of realizing what's been happening to her sons all the time too like it brings the family together it, it's I, I don't want to jump too far ahead of myself but a lot of these uh, all these movies <laughs> that we're watching tonight showcase um in some degree schumacher's optimism as well as the edgy darkness that lies in there as well right he clearly likes to delve into the darkness i feel like he's echoing that from perhaps his own experiences as well bringing that sort of edginess into the world but at the same time i feel like he was such a, a realistic optimist <laughs> basically and I think that's one of the reasons that I respond to his work so often as I do is because he's realistic enough to deal with the darkness and not ignore the darkness that exists in our reality while at the same time having this hopeful spirit and bringing people together at the same time. Right. Uh, I feel like that's a really compelling, interesting aspect of his work and the Lost Boys in its own way, too so much that I could say about the Lost Boys. I'm going to turn it over to you before I just get too carried away talking about so many aspects. You know, I, I mean, to me, and obviously I'm going to go into, you know, some of the same things that you talked about and what makes it good. But for me, just the atmosphere of this movie begins and ends with the music. Um, at the end. I mean that in the best way possible. You know, we talked about before we watched it that, you know, this is an experience as much as it is a film and that vibe on it as soon as it starts. Uh, Cry Little Sister is just a incredibly cool atmosphere setter for you to just jump right into uh, this film. And there's so many good songs in this. It just really creates that, you know, kind of that young, edgy, I guess you could say sexy vibe that they were going for. And maybe we can blame the Lost Boys for sexing up vampires i mean i think there was all you know there's always been a sexual nature of vampire stories uh and you know ann rice was writing you know interview with the vampire long <laughs> before lost boys but in terms of just like film and like what it would eventually lead to twilight like maybe we can blame the lost boys for that but I don't want to because I really enjoy the vibe of this movie. And it is, it's just cool. And I don't care 
like some people might go, oh, it is so 80s. Well, I, I don't care. Like it, that, and the fact that it's 80s has nothing to do with it. I, mean, I can't argue that it is very 80s, but it, I don't think about that when I'm watching it. I'm very much caught up in the movie. And I, I love kind of the, uh, the clash of, of styles and, and some of, you know, the characters, of course, you know, David and, and the gang are, you know, <laughs> very macho, um, except for Alex Winter. <laughs> and of course he would be the one they kill, but that's just, you know, that's just hilarious. But I I like their look. I, I like Michael. I think Jason Patrick's really great in this movie. Uh, I think he's kind of an underrated, very underrated actor anyway. He's, he's been in some good stuff. He's been in some not so good stuff. <clears throat> Speed 2. Uh, but uh, he's really good in this. And I think family is a big part of this movie. And, and like you mentioned, the brothers, you know, you can tell. I think he and Corey Haim both really sell their brotherhood. And that's what really kind of keeps this movie the serious parts of this movie stick is their you know love for each other and also you know their mom too you can tell they care about each other and that this isn't just a oh no my brother's a vampire type thing there's actually emotional depth to it but it never takes it too far down the serious route where it's hopeless. You know, there's there's a lot of fun. This is one of the most fun movies. This is one of the most enjoyable movies I've ever seen. It's a crowd pleaser, but it's also a horror film. And it's and that's actually, you know, the only movie I can think of that is more because this is, I mean, at the end of the day, I consider Lost Boys a horror film. It's you know, it's October, that's why we're talking about it. I wouldn't, you know, the only movie that I would consider maybe that's just a little bit better at the mix of humor and horror than this is American Werewolf in London, which is just one of the absolute best movies ever so the only you know there aren't very many movies that can really capture in the 80s you know there were a lot of they were that was kind of a thing that they were always going for or were a lot trying to mix in a decent amount of humor with the horror and you know american werewolf did it uh the howling did it uh gremlins did it, and I and I love all of these movies for different reasons. But I think you know, kind of at the top, uh, is American Werewolf and the Lost Boys, and the Lost, and they're two different, trying two completely different kinds of movies. I'm not trying to you know compare them as they are you know going for the same exact thing. They're going for completely different vibes, and I think you know American Werewolf completely succeeds at what it's trying to do, and Lost Boys completely succeeds in what it's doing. And it has a great blend of those crowd-pleasing moments that I feel like would be the MCU crowd-clapping moments we would get now. But, you know, specifically, (laughs) when Grandpa crashes through the (laughs) cabin and hits Max with the, uh, you know, the post problem with... (laughs) Santa Carlos, all the all the damn vampires. You know, that's just a great line. It's a great way to end the movie too. That he was the twist that he knew about it all along. It's one of the funniest things about the movie to me is grandpa, like just you know <laughs> he's he's been kind of aloof the whole time and like you mentioned, he's 
laying there, pretending to be dead. Nobody either knows. Nobody, nobody <laughs> thinks he's doing it or seems to care. Like it's, it's. He's a hilarious character, and he very much fits in with this. And no, nothing really kind of sticks out. I like, you know, and I said family is a big theme in this, and I like David and his his group. And Keith or Sutherland is awesome, and I'm gonna say this about Flatliners too, but I he doesn't necessarily have too much to say in this. Movie. But regardless of that, this is the – when I think Keith or Sutherland, if I don't think Jack Bauer first, I think Lost Boys because of the look and feel of this movie. He very much fits and eats up the scenery and steals every scene he's in. And that's still, you know, with Jason Patrick being awesome in this too. but. Keith or Sutherland is David is great, but going back to the family theme, you know, these brothers and sister, they're, you know, they're all family, and Max, of course, is revealed to be the real leader. They're, they, the Frog Brothers, of course, another family, but I'm not going <laughs> to treat them as, you know, too central to that theme as, as uh, uh, Michael and Sam. And you know the actual Lost Boys. I uh, I really like that dynamic and that they were trying to get Michael to join them and that you know trying to eventually get Sam too and get them all to to join the family. I liked that idea. I liked the way it was executed. And you know Jeffrey Baum, we've already name dropped some of his other work, I think he's really good at that family or friendship dynamic and it shows in this movie. Schumacher runs away with it too. It just it, it oozes style. It has strong emotional ties to it. It has so much atmosphere to it. It's a great looking movie to me. It, it, it's just very distinct. It's a blast. It's entertaining from beginning to end. There is not one moment in that movie that is boring. There is not one moment in it that's really kind of trivial. It's just it's just one of the most fun movies there is. And I, you know, I've seen it. I don't know how many times I have seen it. You know what it is. What's that? It's an A+. Plus. <laughs> oh, yeah, I I can't argue that. I gotta I, I I give it that too. This is you know it's it's great and there's no denying that. So yeah, I I give it an A plus it, on each viewing. It's just as good, if not better, than the last time you've seen it. And and I I think that's you can't ask for any better than that. It's just one of those. One of those kinds of films. And I I kind of, when you were talking about uh, the possibility of, of younger kids uh, being in this kind of story, um, like the Richard Donner version, that's probably the uh, 1987 season we're going to get of Stranger Things. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to see uh, Dustin accidentally kill a vampire, which will be hilarious. Uh, kind of joking i also wouldn't be surprised but it, it is interesting to think of a more goonies-esque version of the lost boys and you know even though it might be a good thing i think richard donner's great um we've talked we've talked about lethal weapon but because bone worked on lethal weapon two and three yeah uh, <laughs> but uh, two Lethal Weapon 2 is a, and the first one are, are great, great films. Uh, Rich Donner is a, is a really good director. And I, I could see him doing a good story with this, but I wouldn't want to trade that for what this is. I, I love the kind of more 
edgy aspects of this movie. And yeah, A plus all the way. It's great. Still, after all this time, it has an age a bit, fittingly enough. You know, the star of this movie, though, too, as, as amazing as uh, so much of the main cast uh, might be, including Jason Patrick and Kiefer, is just unreal, compelling, and magnetic. The star, though, is Timmy Capello. Yes. <laughs> I just don't think we could possibly talk about The Lost Boys without mentioning our lead saxophone player. And one of my favorite things about seeing him recently in the gunship Dark All Day video is like when you see the animation in the first part of the video. Yeah. And you see this impossibly ripped saxophone player. And you're like, well, that's complete caricature. That's completely absurd. But if you know the guy, then you already know. No, that's really him. Right. And then, of course, it cuts to live action at the end. <laughs> and it's like... He, the animation doesn't do him justice. No, it's he still got it. <laughs> Props though. Props to the saxophone. That scene is is uh, one of the funniest and coolest. I mean, it it really it really speaks to this movie because it's hilarious that this muscular dude is shirtless playing a saxophone, but at the same time. He pulls it off, and it's a cool scene with with Michael, kind of becoming infatuated with Star, who we we haven't even really talked about. Jamie Gertz, I like their uh, chemistry in this. Oh, she's good. I, I like their scenes together. Uh, you know, I really enjoy kind of their love scene, and just their like. We just talk about how cool the hangout is, like the. Uh, the hotel on the cliff. The production do- design in this movie is all around the thing. Yeah. I, and I, I completely agree with you about, you know, seduction of Michael is well done. You know, they're, they're hanging out in the lair, like eating Chinese food and, and like Michael's eating noodles and, David says something about worms. <laughs> he looks and sees worms or maggots. Those, those are those are really kind of stand out moments and played straight too. I think that those things really do pay off. It, like the fun, the the duel, the if you will call it that, the fight between Michael and David at the end is really cool, and I like how it's built up too. And like you said, all the characters. The Frog Brothers are so stupid, and I love them for that. Like they're just idiots. Like the uh, and that's the point of them. That's what they're supposed to be. And like uh, Corey Feldman is hilarious in this because he takes himself so seriously, or the char- the character does. Jameson Newlander, they they you know they think they know everything and. Every time they kill a vampire, it's it's a complete surprise to them. Like when they kill uh, <laughs> Alex Winter, of course, but like even when they're doing like the whole holy water guns and the garlic and everything else and the steaks, just in, the, in that invasion kind of part at the end, it, it <laughs> with, with the vamps like vamp out and uh and die you know like when they get the guy in the the bathtub <laughs> it's hilarious like their reactions and so like them all kind of being fish out of water you know with this it it really does add an element to it that if they you know were blade and were professional vampire killers do it every day it wouldn't be the same movie, and I, I don't do that to this Blade, because I, God knows I enjoy Blade and Blade too. but then it's a completely different movie. You know, I'm glad the Frog Brothers are idiots and completely out of their depth, uh, because it just, it, it really fits 
the tone of this movie and like I think that movies like this that do have kind of a serious horror side and a humor you can risk your tone you can risk you know not being true to the story you're trying to tell and kind of going all over the place this this is completely balanced whenever it needs to be serious it's serious whenever it it can indulge in the humor it does and it never goes too far one way or the other and it's a perfect balance and and like i said the only other movie i can think of that does that just um you know as good if not better is american werewolf and you know in london not paris just in case anyone's wondering that's that's good company to be in there there aren't very many movies like Lost Boys either that kind of have that distinct vibe. It, it's kind of one of it's kind of one in a million, you know. It, it's we we really haven't seen anything like it before it, and like after it, nothing really successfully imitated it. And it, it's a classic. There's there's not much more to say about it. it it's it's just it's a classic. We talked about you know how sleek and stylish the movie is too, and Joe Schumacher was you know a fashion guy before he was a film director, so obviously that sleekness is kind of innate in him, to some measure, but it's also worth mentioning the cinematographer of the Lost Boys, Michael Chapman, who also shot Taxi Driver, yes, and Raging Bull. Like, yes. holy cow, in the 78 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, those are some of my favorite movies. Incredibly gorgeous, incredibly well shot movies. The Lost Boys was shot in three weeks right. production, so it was very tight. And I think you can sense that to some degree, especially if you're thinking about that while you're watching it. It's not the biggest production in many ways but what it does it does so cleverly and so well and so sleekly that it works and it's a it's a blast and it's a great movie so this was 87 it really helped cement uh joe schumacher as a bigger director you know because it was a, a decent hit you know, and has its fan base. Uh, before he made Lost Boys, he also made Santa Almost Fire, which is the reason you have that uh, picture poster of uh, Rob Lowe on uh, Corey Haim's closet door. Schumacher's paying homage to one of the stars of Santa Almost Fire. But three years after Lost Boys, you get Flatliners, 